continue the discussion about this new API stack, right? For uh, that we're building with uh, a talk from Aliana Inzana, um, uh, who is an API product leader, uh, and uh, who will talk us talk with us about metamorphosis. Event-driven revolution is evolution. Hello, Aliana. Hi, Mary. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really well. We're really glad to have you. Uh, you have been speaker in the past, and we love to invite you with your enthusiasm and your knowledge. So please share it with us for the next 20 minutes. Will do. Uh, so hello, everyone. Welcome to Metamorphosis. The event-driven revolution is evolution. I promise I will post the slides after the talk, but also please feel free to connect with me on uh, Twitter or on LinkedIn. And off we go. So event-driven architecture. What do we know? Well, it's certainly not new. Uh, there are particular protocols that even predate fielding in 2000. We also know that event-driven architectures have progressed quite a lot in the past, I'm going to go with three to five years. So in today's talk, we're going to take a very high-level survey, looking at a few of the drivers of the EDA revolution, and then I'll try to fetch my crystal ball and come up with some amusing predictions about the future of EDA in our organizations. I think we can learn a lot from how RESTful APIs have evolved and what was key to moving them forward, both within an individual organization, but also for us as an industry. And we'll use that understanding as the framework for evaluating where we are with events and where we're going. So let's start with a couple vocabulary words, like what does it mean to be event driven? A definition I've always liked for events is events are the facts of a system. Each event has the potential to trigger a change in state in the broader ecosystem. And the term event is used both for the type of system, the ecosystem, and also the actual event or message payload itself. The focus of event-driven architecture is around communication, specifically communication, capture, processing, and persistence of events. In contrast, REST is focused on the request that mediates a response. They've been around for a long time, but compared to REST, EDA maturity has lacked. Why is that? Well, in mid-2000s, Martin Fowler was writing about the various architectural patterns that organizations use to derive value from their events. So we know they've been around for 20-odd years, that they predate the web with message-oriented middleware and ESBs. Um, I can think of any number of contributing factors for event-driven architecture having its moment now, but I think for me at least, there are sort of a major three. Microservices, real-time applications, and a common vocabulary, specifications like async API and the tooling that leverages it. So let's examine this big three in slightly more detail. Uh, microservices, what are they? Well, they're services, but they're very small. Uh, <laughs> they are, uh, you know, sort of, bounded context of a domain and services that do one particular thing, very focused, independently deployable. In SmartBear's state of API survey for at least the third year running, microservices were the technology that respondents thought would be a major growth driver for APIs. 61% of the respondents ranked it as number one. The business value corollary to microservices is digital transformation we modularize our business in ways that makes it easier for us to interact across our many silos. And it enables teams or divisions to act independently. Traversing those bounded contexts is not necessarily a synchronous operation, right? In fact, if you approach it with only synchronous operations, you would frequently wind up with a distributed monolith, not discrete services loosely coupled at all. The next major driver, real-time applications. In fact, I often think that these first two are related. There's been an enormous growth in data from sensors, from IoT devices, and it would be impossible to process it without the parallelization that's enabled by microservices and event brokers. In 2020, Akamai's platforms processed more than 3 trillion API requests, and that was a 53% year-over-year increase. 
processing these new this information into new work streams is a huge aspect of how we are beginning to use and work in a real-time API economy. And finally, without a common vocabulary to describe the events and event infrastructure, it's actually pretty challenging to share the value that you've created. One of the initial event-driven specifications, cloud elements, was focused very much on the event message or message payload, which is important, don't get me wrong, but you can't read a letter if the post office doesn't know where to deliver it, or to make it a little bit more analogous, if you don't know where to go to pick up your mail from a post office box. Specs are also a means to create a programmatic interaction with event-driven services. Instead of hand coding each of these integrations, whether they're a test, um, sorry, interactions, uh, whether they're a test or integration, we can actually hook into the structure that a spec provides and reduce the need for any bespoke coding or constant refactoring. So as an industry and within our individual organizations, there are a few recognizable phases uh, to maturing practices and approach to APIs and services. At each level, they're both intrinsic and extrinsic factors that either will hold us back or push us forward. And while certain elements of each maturity model are unique, I believe that the underlying principles that drive service maturity are not that, that different. What is different though, is where one individual organization lies on the continuum um, on, you know, for APIs versus for events. In other words, you could be sort of, you know, here with your API practice, I don't know if that's actually showing, uh, with your API practice, but f much further uh, back in your event-driven practice. So as a footnote, I wanna say that I am indebted to David Muter, senior analyst from Forrester, for his work on event-driven architecture maturity path. Uh, David and I presented together, I think it was like maybe last April, he tackled event-driven architecture and its architectural patterns while I discussed their ramifications for testing. While there's some different items in the checkboxes, whether you're talking about APIs or event-driven services, the stages are bounded by some of the same concerns. According to Forrester, most companies that they talk to are in the strategic phase, uh, sorry, in the consolidated phase of event-driven architecture. Um, the, 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 the strategic phases governed and transformative, I'll be polite and say they remain aspirational. And this aligns with what I've seen as an API testing tool product manager too. You know, in contrast, I think many organizations are firmly edging into having a strategic approach to their REST APIs. Whether or not they do it in a uniform manner is something to be debated, but um, overall, some of the values of the organizational scale phase you can see in many organizations today, whereas from an event-driven standpoint, I still think we're seeing much more sort of ad hoc use, um, idiosyncratic. So as their approach matures, the value created by the organization, by their APIs, by their services increases. So I'd like to sort of begin at the beginning with our first steps into the adoption of APIs and services. In the beginning, there was an abstraction. And in particular, it was an abstraction of a connection. In REST, your first API was likely to be an abstraction over a database. And to be honest, in many cases, that abstraction wasn't very abstract either. Um, similarly, in an event-driven architecture, your first service is typically just a point-to-point -point connection. Events were used out of necessity to call a function or because polling was inefficient. In practice, this was often facilitated via a simple message queue and perhaps some sort of handshake to validate message delivery with tools like RabbitMQ or WebSphere. EDA and APIs share some characteristics at this phase. In general, they lack 
a lot of complexity. And the value that they're creating is not shared outside of the author or the team. This stage is also de um, definitely characterized by decentralization on approach. In EDA, that manifests as ha in how the broker tech is chosen, which I'm only slightly facetiously calling, we used whatever was around and also whatever was free. Events basically are a coding pattern. They're not really an architectural decision at this level. It's low stakes, but this is often how we begin. APIs are services which are entirely independent from each other and also from the broader service ecosystem. The interesting thing about creating value in this in a manner that is inherently consumable is that other people are gonna to wanna to use it. When others in our organization find uses for that API, initially knowledge of how to work with it would pass via word of mouth. The first real push to the next level of maturity comes from consumption. Simply put, asking Bob how his API works at a certain point is not a scalable solution. So perhaps Bob annotates his code to generate a spec, and he's doing this as an aid to discoverability or for his QA team. In the big picture, by the way, this code first approach is actually the origin story for some of the major specification formats like OAS, the spec formerly known as Swagger. Collaboration and test automation are easier if everyone is using a common language to describe the APIs, both how they're structured and how they're deployed. All right. For event-driven architecture, Narrowing the broker selection allows teams to reuse or repurpose integrations. This is similar in APIs. So basically, everyone doesn't have to reinvent the wheel every time someone wants to use Elasticsearch or connect to Stripe for payment processing. What begins as improvements to awareness becomes the foundation for intentionality. But tools definitely play a role here. They can assist with testing, with automation, uh, and prototyping and validation with design first APIs. Although in these early phases, I tend to think of it as design first at first. In other words, it's used primarily for greenfield APIs, but design first is not necessarily used when you're iterating. Um, the use of event-driven architectural patterns also would fit in. Uh, for example, REST-like events carried state transfer might evolve into a more complex web of interactions. Like event sourcing with CQRS. The central nervous system of that type of interaction becomes the event. So both APIs and event-driven architecture experience a consolidation of tools and tech. Frameworks and spec-based tooling make automation easier, and broker technology becomes standardized, allowing for more fluid collaboration and cross-pollination between individuals and teams. The patterns, of, the patterns and the tech of the collaboration and automation phase are most easily mediated, or most easily sort of spread out and disseminated at the level of the individual team or a small business unit. At the organizational scale phase, however, APIs and services shift from being used idiosyncratically to becoming governed. In fact, governance is such an important concept as, at this phase that Forrester chose to name the phase governed. So this shift is underpinned by use of tools and frameworks to level set expectations around performance, reliability, discoverability, and of course, governance. In fact, I'd go so far to say that this, if this phase had a catchphrase, it might be the evolution of reasonable expectations. Strategic management at organizational scale is not only about specs or code or even the people. It is the proverbial three-legged stool. People who agree to a particular process, which is guided but also enforced by tools. Whereas the proto-service back I don't know, about four slides ago uh, was perhaps building an abstraction over a database, 
at this level, we are now building abstractions over those abstractions. Despite the bound, bounded context of domains or business units, events will help us to de-silo and enrich data in the enterprise. Data becomes the consumer market, which is a power shift that's fully realized in the final phase, transformative or developer experience. As we've progressed through the stages of API and service maturity, we focused on singular types. I think of it as API monoculture. It's all rest. If you do events, everything's Kafka. Uh, but when we reach organizational scale, there's a distinct shift away from the, I think, somewhat myopic focus on a single API style. Um, example would be the warehouse team working on the inventory API. Instead, we're embracing a broader definition of done. And that will encompass layers of data that are being pooled from many sources. Most organizations employ multiple API protocols to achieve this depth of enterprise insight. Developer and event portals, I should say, and or event portals, honestly, um, because often they're not the same. Um, they're key to centralizing the value that's created, making you know, your content available to anybody in your organization. And this is, unsurprisingly, one of the areas where event-driven services lag considerably. There's few vendors who are tackling the challenge of event portals and even fewer who are aggregating multiple styles and protocols within a single developer portal. I would say that the final push to next level maturity comes when an organization's APIs and services not only deliver business value, but the whole organization acknowledges that they deliver business value. As the first two phases, the tactical phases, are focused on the API or event providers, the strategic phases represent the rise of the consumer. APIs and events are not a means to an end, nor are they viewed as solely the technical how, but they are also the what which creates and delivers on the business strategy. The latter stages of maturity are where we think of APIs and events as products, and that's the key reason why I think of this pinnacle as developer experience. Usability is accorded the same level of focus and investment as any customer facing product. Theoretically, everyone, that is a good thing that is not an idle threat, by the way. Uh, but even as specs are embedded within developer or event portals and they're invoked for server security or deployment metadata, we can see where without specifications to describe and tooling to support our APIs and events, evolution would stall out. John Houston Finley defined maturity as the capacity to endure uncertainty. If the events of the past year have shown us nothing else, they've proven that organizational resilience is tested more by an uncertain future than by failed products, missed markets, even scandals. The breadth and depth of data available could paralyze a less mature organization. Through APIs and events, there are ways to learn and analyze systems without real world impact. So I wanna take one moment to do a quick case study and talk about digital twins. In uh, MIT Sloan Review, there was an article by two UC Berkeley professors, Apte and uh, Spanos. They wrote an interesting case study on what they called, the article was called um, the digital twin opportunity. I love their definition of a digital twin. Uh, it is a dynamic model of a physical system that enables fast and creative experimentation at low cost and low risk. My personal uh, initial exposure to the digital twin concept was system virtualization for testing purposes, trying to eliminate bottlenecks when evaluating elevator APIs or Wi-Fi connected washing machines. But companies who have reached the transformative level of service maturity can use a digital twin in a much more generative way. They can pair a model of the physical system, let's say it's a building, with sensor data from within the actual structure. In the article's case study, the authors evaluated office buildings, which 
typically account for 40% of global energy consumption. Using digital twin technology, the researchers were able to modify heating, cooling, and ventilation inputs and optimize based on real world weather conditions and monitored via sensor data from within a school in Singapore. They cut energy consumption in half. This is only a single example of how the availability of information and insight structured for elastically scalable consumption and usability and used in service of an organization's strategic objective can drive real organizational value created by and delivered through APIs and events. So in summary, I'm always a tad bit skeptical when I'm told this next best thing will revolutionize our business. I also feel like we believe calling something evolutionary is necessarily selling it short. And yet, in the lab, scientists have evolved unicellular organisms into snowflake multicellular yeasts in a matter of weeks. Evolution takes time in aggr aggregate, but specific examples can actually transpire very quickly. In our ecosystem, I see tooling and architecture as key elements to enablement of progression. They allow the organization to realize the potential of a more methodical approach to events and event-driven components of the broader ecosystem. And the key to unlocking the path to EDA material, maturity materialized in sync with the creation of async API specification. Without a standard description language, like async API or the open API specification, API blueprints, um, the tooling and architectural patterns will always be disjointed. And adoption of a spec almost always lags behind the evolution of spec focused tooling. But this is very much an ecosystem play. And the play happens between people like developers, documenters, integrators, but also the product folks, the data scientists the processes like API and event governance, and the tools which should serve to enable the previous two. So as we leave this restful monoculture and embrace the diversity of multiple protocols coexisting and also specializing to create business value in our service ecosystems, specifications will take on greater importance, um, but also well-governed specifications will provide the right vocabulary for not only implementing existing capabilities, but also creating new behaviors. The spec is a dictionary, but the capability or the behavior, things that are created by stringing together multiple API calls across multiple protocols, that's the pros. Yeah, Aliana. If we have one minute to wrap up, yeah, perfect. That's uh, perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> we have one quick question about about this. You say it's not a revolution; it's just evolution. Uh, at some point, um, uh, would you say that uh, it's really driven by the use case, or it has been driven by mostly architectural constraint of performance? So, is it mostly user driven, or let's say architecture driven, like? Um, you know, I, I've seen some interesting examples of both. Um, I think initial forays into using event-driven architectures, for example, you know, they're they're often necessitated. Like, well, we need to call function as a service, so let's just, we'll use this. Um, and you know, across the board, through all different types of protocols, specifications, technology one of the biggest barriers to adoption, um, and this is also pro proven out in, in Smart Bear's uh, most recent survey, survey before as well, is lack of skills and technology. So there's another really great reason for calling evolution on this, because when you look at even, let's say, the async API specification, it evolved from, and Fran would say this, I think, you know, he tried <laughs> really hard to use uh, OAS to do what he needed to do and realized at a certain point it, it just broke. He couldn't do that. And so he began to build the async API specification. It inherited some of the limitations of the open API specification, but at the same time, it also um, kind of 
provided developers with a level of familiarity because they were using something that was, you know, it, it's a little bit like you're in your living room, but the furniture has been rearranged in some ways. Um, but it helps people begin to uh, adopt technology if there is some familiarity with it, but then you evolve off of that base. And I think that that is a really important um, characteristic that a lot of adopted, well-adopted, well-used technology share. That sort of evolutionary sort of standing on the shoulders of giants and then continuing um, divergent evolution, really. That you understand. Uh, that you understand it. And uh, uh, yeah, let's say we see a huge trend. It, uh, and as you said, the async API specification is really uh, enabling a lot of people to trust into future governance models that are uh, reliable. Thank you very much, Aliana. Thank uh, you. Uh, yes, and thank you for making your slides uh, available, as you say.